Today we discuss a 70s folk band that was too twisted to find success. He's got a record cat and he's talking about some man and man is strong and music hunt. Our story begins in London when Roger Wooten, a songwriter, guitarist, and singer, meets Glenn Goring at the Ravensbourne College of Art in 1967. Glenn was also a guitarist, and the two of them bonded over their love of the pentangle. At Ravensbourne, Glenn and Roger met violinist Colin Pearson, as well as the man that would become their manager, Chris Ewell. Chris was studying The Mask by John Milton called Comus, and he suggested that as the band's name. After that, Roger started writing lyrics that incorporated some of the themes from The Mask. These first few members of Comus played at some folk clubs around, but they found a home at an arts lab in Beckenham when the co-owner, David Bowie, seemed to enjoy what the band was coming up with. This is where they would meet bassist Andrew or Andy Hellaby, as he was playing with another band at the time and approached Comus about adding to their sound. Shortly after he joined the band, someone heard the then 16-year-old Bobby Watson harmonizing over some music and asked her to join the band. Colin Pearson and Bobby Watson's piano-playing friend Rob Young then joined the band and actually taught himself to play flute, oboe, and bongos specifically to play with Comus. This now-established six-piece band went on to continue to hone their set and gather a loving audience as their manager, Chris Yule, would book them shows and continue to look for more interesting opportunities for the band. It was around this time that they auditioned for Canadian filmmaker Lindsay Shontef, and the band ended up contributing music to two of his films, 1970's Permissive and 1973's The Big Zapper. Their friend David Bowie was enjoying the success of his hit Space Oddity and invited them to play a prestigious gig that ended up paving the way to them getting a recording deal. Their first official release was a single version of their song Diana that came packaged along with two songs that we do not hear on their debut full length. The single was released February 5th, 1971, and two weeks later, First Utterance would come out on February 19th, with 10,000 copies pressed. There is so much to say about the sounds of this album. It can be scary, disturbing, weird, ominous, just carry you off in a trance of beautifully woven acoustic instrumentation. It's totally one of a kind and unique. The dark and strange voices of Roger Wooten have an intense yet beautiful contrast to the angelic harmonies provided by Bobby Watson. Add some bass, two acoustic guitars, violin, woodwinds, occasional tribal percussion, and you have the one-of-a-kind sound of Comus. Though it was often that we didn't hear all of these elements all at the same time because the band allowed for a lot of space and really gave everybody their time to shine. To further increase the psychedelia and strangeness of the band, the bassist would add atmospheric sounds with some kind of right hand sliding technique that I'm sure I'm not doing right at all. The demented and distorted character on the front of this cover was penned by Roger Wooten and is an excellent introduction to what you are grabbing when you are picking up a copy of this album. Glenn Goring was also able to share his visual artistry as he painted the inside to this beautiful gatefold. This is a concept album that seems to transport you to a dark fantasy world with the mood of the music and the often oppressive, brutal story song lyrics. Today, this album is looked at with wide eyes of appreciation, but unfortunately, it failed to break through. The band continued to tour Europe in 1971, but confidences were starting to wane and Rob Young would be the first to leave the band. Bassoonist Lindsay Cooper joined the band, and in early 72, the band was working on what they called the Mall Guard Suite, which was going to be a massive piece of music. But when they brought it to their record label, of course the record label was like, you should make it into a three minute single. Dampening spirits even further, Chris Yule took a new position at Polydor Records, and the band decided to call it quits. In 1974, at behest of the newly formed Virgin Records, Four members of Comus got back together to record a second album called To Keep From Crying. This album's lineup included Roger Wooten, Andy Hellaby, Bobby Watson, Lindsey Cooper from Henry Cow on bassoon and oboe, Gordon Coxon on drums, Keith Hale on keyboards, 
and Didier Malherb from Gong on saxophone. The first album, First Utterance, is beloved because it feels like people doing something new, something expressive, and they don't care what anybody thinks, they are them. But since that didn't seem to work, this second album seems to find us with a band that doesn't know who they are, and you can kind of hear that on this album. They jump around between different things that other progressive folk bands at the time were doing, yet don't really seem to find their own sound. This album is still unique in its own sense, because I mean it is Comus trying to fit in in a new spot in the world, clearly it doesn't sound regular. But I think that it gets a little bit too much hatred on the internet for not being First Utterance. Of course, it's safe to say that this album didn't fare much better than First Utterance, and so the band, of course, parted ways again. In the 90s and 2000s, their albums were re-released, and as the internet grew, music enthusiasts shared it around. Then, as Opeth, the progressive metal band from Sweden, started making references to the band, more and more people became aware of Comus. Due to the new interest on the internet, Comus got back together, and in 2012 they released an album called Out of the Coma. Chris Yule and their original tour manager also rejoined the project, and the band had almost the exact same lineup as First Utterance. Rob Young was the only one not to join, so Bobby's husband, John Seagro, filled his place. Seagro also plays in an interesting band called Red Square, and like Rob Young before him, he learned how to play more instruments, especially to join Comus. Out of the Coma brings us three new songs inspired by the sound of First Utterance, and they certainly deliver. If you wanted more sound like that, here it is. But the real treasure here may be the B-side of this album, which is a 15-minute recording of the first half of the Malgard Suite. Technically, the internet seems to label this as an active band, though I do not see any activity from them as of late at all. I wouldn't be surprised if we see them do a few more shows in the future, maybe just random one-offs every once in a while when they're feeling like getting out of the house. I wouldn't expect them to release any new music, because I feel like in their position, they aren't able to branch out or the fans hate on them, and I hate that. So I think Roger should prove us wrong and make some awesome new music. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. I plan to release these videos weekly on obscure bands that you may never have heard of, so subscribe me for more. Like and comment on this video if you enjoyed it, especially telling us if you enjoy Comus. What's your favorite song by Comus? Is there a weird progressive folk band that you enjoy? Let us know down in the comments. I will catch you on the next one. Have a happy listening session.